Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me on episode 20 of the show about the show. My name is Devlin Clark. I'm the creator and host of the show. As always, this much like every other episode of my podcast is dedicated to the memory of my dad, Peter, who taught me how to love baseball. And one of the things that I love about baseball is movies. I love baseball movies, Field of Dreams, The Sandlot, Eight Men Out, The Natural, many other other great baseball movies. Some some movies that a lot of people don't like, like Cobb, or that have been historically inaccurate, that certain people don't like, but I do, is uh, are a lot of fun. But baseball in general is just a lot of fun, and so much like I said, this, like every episode, is dedicated to the memory of my father. Today, episode 20, you guys, it this is the big one. Back in 1993, a little movie about baseball came out called The Sandlot. It was about a kid named Scott Smalls trying to fit in. And little did we know as a country, and I'm sure the, I'm sure people making the movie had no idea, that it was going to become such a big cult classic and go on to have millions and millions of fans all around the world. I am pleased today to have the director writer, narrator. He pretty much he pretty much did a lot of stuff on that movie. David Mickey Evans. He directed it, he wrote it, he narrated it. He's going to come on. He's on and we are going to talk some Sandlot. We're going to find out about Squints and Hamilton and Wendy Peppercorn and it's going to be a fun half an hour. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, the director of my favorite baseball movie of all time, David Mickey Evans, director of The Sandlot. How you doing, David? I'm doing great. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing really, really well. I cannot tell you what a thrill this is for me. I grew up with The Sandlot. It came out when I was nine years old, and uh, it's been my favorite baseball movie ever since. So this is a big thrill for me. <laughs> well, I appreciate the kind words, man. That's fantastic. I never get never get tired of hearing that, and uh, uh, remain intensely grateful that people continue to love the film so much. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about kind of the origins of the film. Where did you come up with the idea for this? Was it based on an experience that you had? Was it based on somebody you knew? Take us back to how you came up with the idea for the movie. Sure. Uh, let's see. When I was a little kid, my, my little brother and I lived on a uh, on a block in the northeastern San Fernando Valley where we were sort of the outsiders and the kids that lived on our block. They didn't like us. They used to bully us and beat us up. And these guys would play basketball in the middle of the street. It was a very, very sort of lower, uh, a very poor area. So they'd play basketball during basketball season, the middle of the street, football during football season, of course, baseball during baseball season. And they would never let us play. I mean, they would never pick us to be on a team or anything like that. And I think I was probably about 10. My little brother's maybe 8, maybe maybe 9 and 11, something like that. And uh, one, and my little brother and I went everywhere together. But that day, he uh, saw them playing baseball down at the end of the block, and I didn't, I didn't see him. So he went down there to try to see if he could play. And um, in those days, if you played baseball, you had a baseball, not a bucket of baseballs you know, like you do today, and they had a baseball, right. and they hit it over the, the backyard fence of this house at the end of the block, and there was a uh, a very vicious dog back there whose name actually happened to be Hercules, and this uh, <laughs> owner kept, yeah, kept him on a chain, and he was, you know, not treated well and all that. Anyway, they hit this ball over there and told my little brother, uh, sure, you, can, you go get that baseball, you can play with us. So he said, uh, okay, and he went over the fence and got the ball, but the dog broke the chain and bit his leg really bad, had to go to the hospital and all that sort of thing. He made it back over the fence, but it, it got him pretty bad. And they were all laughing at him and, 
They just thought that was hilarious. That's the real life incident that gave rise to the Sandlot. Now, when I, you know, had a I had that memory in '92. Obviously, I couldn't, you know, <laughs> it's not much of a story. Uh, a bunch of bullies and a poor little kid that gets bit by a dog. So uh, many years later, when I was adult, you know, I uh, dwelled on that a lot because I really, I really want to get back at those guys. And it seemed to me that that was taking up too much space in my soul and my brain. So I got to write something about this. So what am I going to do? And I says, well, I'm just going to get rid of this out of my head, but I'm going to turn them all into heroes. So that's essentially what I did. And uh, the, the real-life head bad guy, you know, became Benny the hero and, and like that. And Scotty Smalls is sort of me and my little brother combined. And, but anyway, that's how, it, that's how it happened. Do do those bullies know that they became part of a legendary baseball movie? Well, they didn't because I don't, you know, obviously, you know, it's all fictional. I mean, the best way to say sure. that is I have no idea, but there, there's this, my, one of my favorite quotes, forwards in any book. I think it's in Mark, Tw- uh, Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer. There's an author's forward in there that says, might be Huckleberry Finn, but I think it's Tom Sawyer. And Mark Twain writes, uh, dear reader, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, none of these boys was any boy I knew, but all of these boys was every boy I knew. So that's how I kind of okay. like to explain it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. That movie, when you guys were making it, it cost you $7 million to make. You guys had, it came out on April 7th, 1993. Like I said, you had a $7 million budget. You, The box office draw from that was $33.8 million, and millions and millions and millions of other dollars in VHS and DVD sales. When you guys were making the movie, did you have any idea at all, like, this is something special? Well, it's, it, it, there's no way for us to have known that it would have become the sort of beloved classic that it's become, that I'm told it's become, and all the accolades and the, the, the longevity that it's had. I mean, it's the number one evergreen film, I believe, in uh, 21st Century Fox's history. It's their number one of, of, of all the you know, thousands of films that they've made. This one every year just never gives up. It, and it keeps going generation to generation. When we were making the film, there's no way to know that. Um, and, yeah, we, we, had a, we had an adequate budget. In those days, that kind of money went, went a long way. I think I had 42 days to shoot this movie. And look, I've made movies in 17 days and 20 days, and, 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 and it's brutal. It's, 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 uh, and it's, you know, one day of disappointment after another. But this picture, I had enough time to, to make it the way that I wanted to make it. Um, and we had a lot of fun. I mean, uh, you know, the crew uh, will tell you, the kids, uh, or all the young men will tell you, it was the greatest summer of our lives. We got to make a movie and play baseball, you know, and mess around with a bunch of English master dogs, and it was just a hoot. Uh, so I knew that it was going to be good, at least what I intended, because of all the fun we were having. But as far as whether it was going to be a success, you know, I hoped it would. But but would people love it? There's no way to know that. Would they continue to love it? And, and would it become a, an evergreen film that's never going to go away and just, so, you know, it makes more money every year than it did the previous year? That's almost impossible. So there's, there was no way to know that. No. Let's talk about the uh, – let's get into some of the details in the movie. So you start out narrating the movie, and you talk about – you don't actually give the specific year. You say it's the year that Dodger Maury Wills breaks the stolen bases record, which is the summer of 1962. You guys filmed the movie in Glendale, Midvale, Salt Lake City, and Ogden, Utah. That's, That's kind of an interesting location. Why did you pick that location, or how did you find out about that location? That's a really good question. The, the script, the film, is uh, written to take place in the northern San Fernando Valley in Southern California. Uh, that, uh, Southern California, especially the L.A. Basin, is ringed by Purple Mountains, the San Gregorio Mountains. It's a very unique-looking place. The, and, of course, it was very expensive to shoot in Southern California. So we needed a place that looked like that, that had uh, that kind of topography and environment that was ringed by Purple Mountains. The only other place that I could find that looked like that was Salt Lake City. 
because the Wasatch Mountains look a lot like the San Gregorio Mountains, and they ring the entire Salt Lake Valley. Um, and it was a whole lot less expensive to shoot there, so it was kind of a no-brainer. That's, that's why we went there. Um, plus, it was all of those places that you mentioned, is the, that is where we shot, including, I think, American Fork, were very relatively close to each other. So on a, on a limited budget, you kind of want all your locations as as close together as they can be so you don't have to travel long distances and move the crew and all that kind of stuff. So everything sort of worked out really well. It was, it was the perfect place to shoot the movie. Absolutely. You talked, you talked a little bit in the introduction kind of about you and your younger brother being a combination of um, Scott Smalls. Right. What do, you, what do you think it is between the, that the relationship between Benny and Smalls <laughs> is so is so powerful and so many people can relate to it. What is it about their relationship that people can relate to? That's a good question. I, I think it's a couple of things. One, um, all of us were either Scotty Smalls, you know, the kid, the outsider, maybe been bullied, didn't fit in. I think people can identify with that because, you know, a lot, that happens to a lot of us. And also, uh, some of us, uh, uh, no matter who you are, had moments of being like Benny, you know, um, the hero, the kid that is the best athlete, guys look up to, want, everybody wants to be his friend and stuff like that. And, and also, if you weren't either of them, you certainly wanted to be like Benny, you know. And I think, more, I think many more people had experiences of being like a Scotty Smalls than a Benny Rodriguez. And I think that... Unfortunately, especially in this day and age, when you get bullied or left out like that, you're constantly wanting someone, you know, to help you out, be your friend. You know, the, the best thing that can possibly happen to you is the most popular kid or the most, uh, uh, the most popular kid. The kid with the most friends befriends you so that you don't get picked on or bullied and includes you so you get to play and have fun as well. I think those are pretty, pretty universal feelings and, and identifications that people make at least over the years that's a lot of people tell me that anyway when when they uh, tell me how much they love the film was that always the plan was to have benny be the one who befriended scotty or was it going to be somebody else no it was always benny yeah in fact it was a, mike v mike retar was the very of the thousands and thousands of kids that i interviewed to uh to cast in this movie. He was the very first kid I ever met. And uh, I wanted to cast him right there, but my casting director says, now, I know he's perfect. Don't worry, he's not going anywhere. Let's look through everything just in case. And it turns out that he was was the one, you know. Absolutely. I mean, the adults in this cast, too. I mean, the the kids in this cast kind of steal the film, but the adults, the adults are, this is a pretty stacked adult cast. You have... You have Dennis, you have Dennis Leary, James Earl Jones, and Karen Allen. Talk about what it was like working with them. Uh, let's see, Dennis Leary. I think that was the first movie he was ever in. He was a huge, huge comedy comedian at the time, and the yep. uh, producer Mark Berg knew him like on a personal basis or whatnot. And we had a lot of uh, you know different actors that we were looking at, and, and Mark made that suggestion. And uh, I had a phone call with Dennis, and we got along real well. And he says, yeah, I'll do it. So that was, that was easy. Um, Karen Allen had at that time, I think, been taking a break from acting because she became a mom and such. And uh, she would always been one of my favorites, you know. I mean, who didn't have a crush on Karen Allen, you know, when they were a teenager? <laughs> I did. And uh, so <laughs> I said, I, I just think she'd be perfect. And I didn't ever think she'd agree to do it. But she said, oh, yeah, I love the script. It's great. I'll do it. So that was pretty easy. And then James Earl Jones. We didn't have a Mr. Myrtle for, I think, the first week or two of shooting. And we didn't know, you know, again, we were looking at a lot of actors and such. And uh, one day my first assistant director, Bill Elvin, the great Bill Elvin, says to me, and I, I think the reason he knew James, Mr. Jones, was because he had worked on Field of Dreams. And uh, okay. he says, what if, so he says, so what about, what about James Earl Jones? I go, yeah, right, like we could ever get James Earl Jones to be in this movie. He goes, no, I'll call him. <laughs> so he called him, and he goes, hey, Mr. Jones, James wants to talk to you. So I got on the phone with him, 
And he said, uh, this is just, this script is just terrific. I love it. And we had a little conversation about uh, Mr. Myrtle and uh, how old he would be, where he would have played baseball and all this sort of thing. And I made a few adjustments to the character for him and, and he showed up. Uh, I only had it for one day. He, he showed up in the morning. We shot all of his material and, and then he, uh, he left. Um, the, the most, uh, one of the greatest guys you'd ever meet in your life. An absolutely terrific man. Wow. That's that. I didn't know that he had shot everything all in one day. That's, that's pretty remarkable. When you, well, he, when you're looking a, at, you got under, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to tell you, the guy is, you, when you talk about a, a consummate actor, an actor's actor, uh, I could, you know, make some changes. James would look at look at them for like, I don't know, 30 seconds and go, I, I got it. I don't know if he has a photographic memory or not, but it sure seems like it. I mean, he just, he can just like literally take a picture of the page, the dialogue's there, and it's a couple of takes and you're done. He's remarkable, just remarkable. One, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, if not the absolute favorite scene. And again, I was nine years old when the movie came out. And I think mm-hmm. this kind of is relative to all uh, early, early age kind of teenage boys is the uh, swimming pool scene. Can you talk to oh, me yeah. about the swimming pool scene and how that came about shooting that? Oh, sure. When I, when I was a little kid, Oh, you know, in the, the, the northeastern San Francisco Valley, the Los Angeles County and the city, but mostly the county, had, I don't even know if these exist anymore, had public swimming pools where, you know, and, and in those days uh, where we lived, you know, the summers would get 100, 110 degrees. It was brutally hot. Uh, and, of course, we had all the bad smog and all that. So, of course, the place you wanted to go, if you had a bike, you'd ride your bike. If not, you'd, you'd walk, was go to the public swimming pool. And I think it costs like a quarter, 50 cents to get in. And uh, you could swim all day and, you know, it was awesome. And they always had at these places, like high, like high school students, like your 17, 18, 19-year-old uh, young people who were the lifeguards. Great summer job for them and all that. And they wore these, uh, the, the, the men would wear, you know, of course, the red trunks, lifeguard trunks. And then the, uh, the young ladies would wear the... L.A. County lifeguard one-piece red suit. And, of course, when you're 11, 12, 13 years old, they're goddesses. At least they were to me. Sure. And uh, I never forgot that. And so when I was writing the the picture, you know, I knew I had to have some sort of scene like that in there. And uh, the idea that the kid (laughs) would risk drowning himself (laughs) just to get a kiss was just too too tasty to, to, it was just too much. I had to write it, you know. And uh, right. so once we had the picture cast and all that, Chauncey Leopardi, who in real life, he was not a little goofy kid like he played in the Sandlot. This this kid was, I guess you'd call him today, a baller, man. He was just like, he had his baseball cap on sideways, baggy pants, you know. He was smiling. Yeah. So that he could play such a little goofball was, was pretty cool. Uh, but the closer we, he'd ask me every day, Mr. Evans, Mr. Evans, when are we going to shoot that scene? Are we going to shoot that scene with Wendy Peppercorn? Are we going to, when are we going to go to the swimming pool? On and on and on, right? <laughs> and, of course, this was just gold for a director because I don't have to make the kid nervous. He already is. It was awesome. Right. So right. I just I keep telling him, I don't know. I could come any time. Watch out. Might do it tomorrow, you know. So I kept just messing with him. And then one day I said, all right, we're going to go to the pool. And, oh, man, I could see the terror in his eyes. And I was like, oh, this is gosh, cinematic gold. This is going to be great. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I introduced him to Marley Shelton, just been so beautiful and such a terrific actress. Right. And she's just looking at him, and his knees are shaking. And I'm like, man, I'm just this is going to be one take. So we get ready to do it where she's going to drag him out of the pool and give him mouth to mouth and all that. And I said, everybody take a knee, give me five seconds here. So I take him aside on the pool deck and I can see he's just terrified, you know? And I go, all right, you ready? He's yeah. I go, look, I'm going to tell you one thing. Okay. 
You know what to do to grin, and I'll give you the cue and all that. But when, when she kisses you, when she gives you mouth to mouth, and you kiss her, he goes, yeah, yeah. I go, keep your tongue in your mouth. Okay? And he seemed to understand what that meant. And literally, what you see in the movie is the first take. We did it. Okay. It came out perfect. Everybody's cracking up. I mean, the whole crew, everybody, even Marley. And uh, right. so he's still laying there in pool deck. I yell, cut. And he goes, uh, Mr. Evans? And I'm like, yeah, Chauncey. He goes, I don't know. I, I think I can do it better. Can we do it again? <laughs> so I, I look at Marley, and she rolls her eyes and goes, yeah, okay, we can do it one more time. So that was a pretty fun day. So at the end of the movie, I got to know, um, at today, in your world, would – Squints and Wendy still be married and still own Vincent's drugstore? Without question, sir. Yes. Absolutely. It was a okay. match made in heaven forever. Yep. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. The other the other scene that I think is really, um, I guess I would say, iconic to that film is the 4th of July scene. And for oh, me, yeah. it's not, it, it's the music. It's Ray Charles' version of America the Beautiful. I I get goosebumps to this day every time that scene comes on. Can you tell me about getting that music, but then also kind of that scene? Absolutely. That that happens to be my favorite scene in the entire movie. Um, and it was really tough to shoot, too, because young actors have a very limited amount of time. They're allowed to work in front of the camera every day. Got to go to school and all sorts of stuff. And then you stop, you start, you stop, you start. And there is a cutoff. Uh, for how many hours they can work in, and they can't work beyond a certain hour at night. So we had sure. all of that against us. Plus, it was summer in Utah, and it didn't get dark until very late. So I think I had about two hours total to shoot that whole scene. And most of that is handheld. Um, and, uh, of course, there were no fireworks above the, the sand lot while we were shooting it. We had to... Uh, we did, we did uh, the whole movie was made very old school. You know, there were puppets, no, there was no CGI at the time and all that. All of those uh, yep. fireworks that you see, we got those shots for free because we happened to be shooting over the 4th of July in Salt Lake City, and the city has a huge fireworks show, so we filmed it all. Later, we took that oh. and, you know, you know soft matted sure. it in above the sandlot and all that, and all the fireworks uh, flashing that you see on the kids' faces it's just a little old Fresnel lamp handheld by a grip with a blue or a red or a green or a yellow uh, uh, piece of uh, filter paper on it, and then we just flashed it at them. So very old school but very effective, very simple. Simple is always better, I find. And uh, it was just a matter of getting Benny to hit that ball uh, up into the air and then uh, uh, going as quickly as we could to each kid to get their reactions. So, I was incredibly fortunate as a director because these, these young guys were Johnny on the spot every time I needed them to be. I mean, yeah, sometimes it was like herding squirrels. I mean, the young, they're kids, you know, they got a lot of energy and all that. But that time, you know, we were such a terrific team that they knew we had to get all that stuff. So they were uh, – every one of those shots that you see those kids reacting to fireworks is one take. There's only one take. So – it was tough, but eventually then I had a, a number of choices for that, for that piece of music to put over that scene. And, of course, it was a no-brainer as soon as I came across uh, or played uh, Ray Charles's song against that scene. The editor and I just looked at each other and went, done, that's it. And then obviously yeah. we just had to go buy the rights, you know. So it was, it was uh, pretty, pretty cool. Unfortunately for me, we only have about five minutes left. This has just been a ro- this has been a trip down nostalgia boulevard, and I am, I absolutely <laughs> love it. But, oh, dude, it's great! Really I love quick. talking to you. Absolutely, thank you so much. I, let's talk about the uh, the the PF flyer scene. How did that kind of sure. come about? You got about five minutes left. No worries. When I was a kid, again, uh, if you, I mean, you know. She didn't wear Nikes or Reebok or whatever. There was none of that kind. Of, well, they were they existed, but they were just in the runners world and stuff. So, you know, we would get like, you know, your no name brand sneakers and such from 
the local discount store and all that. Again, we were very poor. And any kid whose parents had a little money, they'd only have one of two kinds of shoes. Chuck Taylors, Converse Chuck Taylors, high tops. If you had those, you were super cool. But if you had PF Flyers, they'd been around a lot longer. And PF Flyers were kind of like, you know, the Cadillac of kids' uh, shoes. And uh, their motto was PF Flyers, which stands for Posture Foundation guaranteed to make a kid run faster and jump higher. That was their slogan, their, their motto. And so when I got to the thing, to the, the point in the script where many has got to pickle the beast and, and I knew he's going to get chased all over town, there was, there was, there was no other way. It was no, a no-brainer. He had to have PF flyers, the secret weapon. He had to have a secret weapon in order to beat the dog in a race, you know. And so it was PF flyers. There was... You know, you couldn't run around at Chuck Taylor's. Who cares? Right. <laughs> yeah, Got to be right. PF Flyers, man. I mean, Flyers guaranteed to make you jump fast, run faster and jump higher, which is what he had to do. He had to jump higher over that fence twice, and he had to run fast. So it was one of those lucky moments in your writing career when, you know, I didn't even have to think. It was just there. You had a lot – Quite a few of these kids went on to do um, different movies, obviously. Chauncey and Patrick, who played Squint and Ham, ended up doing a movie Mm -hmm. right after this, I believe, called The Big Green. Mike Benny, Mike Vitar, ended up obviously being really famous as Luis in the uh, Mighty Ducks movies. Sure, sure. Do, Do you guys still, do you guys, are you guys still in contact at all? Like, do you ever just, you know, kind of get together and go out to lunch with some of the guys? No, we don't do. We don't have that kind of a thing because I don't. I don't live where they live. Um, I live far away. From okay. Them. Um, but they're all my Facebook buddies. We do talk, you know, from time to time. Uh, in 2013, we all got together for a number of uh, screenings of the Sandlot because of its 20th anniversary. And this year again, 25th anniversary, we're all going to get together again at a bunch of major league baseball fields to uh, screen the movie. So, yeah, we're, we're all still real friendly, and they've all done real well. I'm real proud of them. And, uh, yeah, Pat works all the time as an actor. He's, a, he's, he's got a terrific career. Chauncey, the same thing. Victor Dimasia, or Dimatia, uh, who played uh, Timmy. Uh, uh, he's a filmmaker and, a, and a, uh, an actor. Uh, Grant Gelt is a big-time uh, music producer who played Bertram. Brandon, who uh, played Kenny, uh, I believe is in the music business. Uh, uh, Shane Obazinski, who played um, T- uh, Tommy, the little repeat guy. He owns a restaurant in Tampa, Florida. He's real successful. So they've all done really well. And Marty uh, York, who has uh, played Yaya, yeah, yeah, that little skinny kid, he's a big-time fitness model now and an actor yeah. in tremendous shape. Uh, and Mike, I think, is a real life hero now. Mike Vitar is a LA County fireman. Sure. We have about ninety seconds left. I need to know what happened to Bertram. We know he got really into the '60s, and nobody ever saw him again. You know what? Nobody ever saw him again, man. You, you know, he went to Hate Ashbury <laughs> and got lost. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, he might have ended up being one of Andy Warhol's hangers-on. He may be in Nepal and Tibet, you know, as a monk. I don't know. But uh, whatever it was, uh, I don't think he came to any ill fate. I think he's very happy to this day. What's your favorite quote in this movie? Or your favorite line? Uh, uh, well, I mean, there's so many. But I think, uh, remember, kid, there's heroes and there's legends. Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. Follow your, car, your heart, kid, and you'll never go wrong. That's my favorite line of the movie. Ladies and gentlemen, that could not be a more, there could not be a more perfect ending for that episode. The hero, the legend, the director of maybe the greatest baseball movie for children ever made, The Sandlot. David Mickey Evans. I cannot thank you enough for letting me relive my childhood and for coming on my uh, podcast. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Well, dude, thank you. I had a great time, and I really appreciate the kind word. Thanks for letting me talk. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much.
All right, mate. Talk to you soon. Yep, bye. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what an amazing, amazing trip down memory lane that was. The Sandlot is is a cult classic, and like David said, it was the best summer of his life and the lives of the people who made that film. So if you do not have it, it is the 25th anniversary. Go on eBay, Amazon, Target, Walmart, buy it. If you have not seen it, watch it, love it watch it with your kids any anybody that likes baseball or likes coming of age movies will love that movie if you love this interview please make sure that you give me a five-star review on itunes you can also listen live on any of the to any of the episodes that i i tweet and put the links out on twitter and facebook leave a five-star review and find me on blogcast radio or on Twitter at Devlin underscore Clark 84. That's D-E-V-L-I-N under slash Clark 84. Wow, what an amazing episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. Episode 20 with David Nikki Evans.